In the heart of Gilneas, destiny was a tale spun by the unyielding spirit and unwavering perseverance of its citizens. Proud, stubborn, and averse to seeking help from beyond their borders, the Gilneans stood as a unique breed among humans. Approach them, and you'd sense a distinct wariness in their gaze. Not born of distrust, but rather a defiance that seemed directed not at any specific entity, but at the vast world itself. It was a gaze that spoke of resilience, and a determination to carve their path in a world that often required a stand of independence. Now what happened to the kingdom over its many years? Let's start from the beginning. 2700 years before the Dark Portal, the humans of Erethor, triumphant from the Troll Wars, embarked on an era of expansion. Following the death of King Thoradin, the Empire ventured into the wilderness, birthing new city-states, and among them the formidable Gilneas emerged. Settlers along Gilneas's coastal expanse crafted resilient harbors, but the boldest among them, yearning for a harmonious blend of land and sea, set sail on a quest for a haven to shield their descendants from the relentless ocean waves. In this maritime odyssey, the ancestor of House Stormsong, which is one of the four noble houses of Kul Tiris, stood as the first to catch the whispers of the Tide Mother, unraveling the secrets of the seas for himself and his kin. The whispers led them southward to a vast island teeming with precious metal ores and abundant natural wealth. Here, some chose to establish the mighty coastal outpost known as Coltiris, while tide sages were dispatched to beckon others to join this newfound haven. Yet on this island of promise, the Gilnean colonists found themselves entangled with the native Rykul, the Drust. Despite initial attempts at peaceful coexistence, the Drust swiftly escalated hostilities, launching raids at the humans developing outposts and settlements for generations. The clash between these two forces reached a tipping point, culminating in a decisive conflict that would shape the destiny of both peoples. In the end, the Drust, known as the Thorn Speakers, would join Kul Tiran society as they never wanted to go to war in the first place, and the Order of Embers was formed in order to fight the Drust that wished for war. Humans ended up dominating the region over time. Gilneas's military evolved into one of Arathor's mightiest, standing shoulder to shoulder only with Alterac. Together, Gilneas and Alterac orchestrated grand expeditions, forging alliances to fortify Arathor's borders and extending their reach to the dwarves and gnomes of Kazmadan. As Strom's influence dimmed, the power of Gilneas and fellow city-states ascended, shaping distinctive customs and beliefs. What were once modest trading posts and cities blossomed into independent city-states, gradually becoming more distant and self-contained over generations. A significant turning point arrived 1200 years before the Dark Portal, unraveling the Empire into independent kingdoms. Faced with the naval dominance of Kul Tiris, Gilneas recalibrated its focus. Instead of maritime pursuits, it directed efforts towards strengthening its land-based armies and enhancing trade prowess. 75 years before the First War, Stormwind sought aid during the Null War, but Gilneas, among others, declined, viewing Stormwind as self-sufficient. Now under King Archibald Greymane's rule, who is Gen's father, Gilneas entered its industrial age, transforming into a potent middle power, capable of standing shoulder to shoulder with Kul Tiris and Stromgard. Gen Greymane, inheriting the throne, continued his father's legacy, steering Gilneas towards progress. In the aftermath of the First War and the devastating fall of Stormwind, which saw the assassination of King Lane Wren, a beacon of hope emerged in the form of the Council of Seven Nations. Conceived by Sir Anduin Lothar and King Tyrannus Menethil II, the Council aimed to rally the kingdom against the looming threat of the Orcish Horde. However, convincing Gilneas and Altrac proved to be a formidable challenge, thanks to the deceptive antics of Deathwing. Disguised as a human noble named Davil Prestor, Deathwing sowed seeds of doubt in Mordoran spinning tales that dismissed the orc threat as mere fabrications. These stories gained traction, overshadowing Stormwind's desperate pleas for aid. King Gen Greymane and King Aiden Perinold of Gilneas and Alterac, respectively, remained skeptical, harboring suspicions that there was more to the situation than met the eye. Even when refugees from the orc-conquered Kazmadan, including gnomes and dwarves, sought refuge, the resistant kings held firm. Fearing a loss of regional power through alliance, they staunchly resisted calls for unity, causing a rift in the council. Tensions escalated to the point where Gilneas and Alterac contemplated abandoning the alliance altogether. In this precarious situation, a turning point arrived with the entrance of Turalyon, a revered priest from Lordaeron. Turalyon took Varian by his side and told people to put aside their differences and realize that they had the chance to prevent cities from burning and prevent more children from becoming orphans like Prince Varian, if they survived at all. Noting that the orcs were not merciful people, he argued that the kingdom stood at a crossroads. If they failed to unite and stand against the orcs, history would remember humanity as a people too proud to stand together and fight for what needed to be done. 
a people who had a chance to save Azeroth but instead threw it all away over politics and illusions of power. His impassioned and charismatic plea for unity resonated with even the most doubtful members of the assembly. His words bridged the divides and the council unanimously voted to establish the alliance of Lordaeron, uniting all the human kingdoms against a common foe. As the second war loomed, Gilneas had firmly etched his place on Lordaeron's political canvas. King Gengreymane, confident in Gilneas' strength, wasn't an ardent supporter of the alliance. Convinced his own armies could handle any threat, he dispatched a token force to maintain trade relations with other kingdoms. In a bid for leadership, Greymane proposed himself as the supreme commander of the alliance, citing Gilneas' vulnerable southern position. He argued that if the horde wasn't repelled, his kingdom would be the first to fall. When the war erupted, Greymane held his armies in reserve until the enemy breached his borders. Only then did he engage in combat against the orcs, with some Gilnean soldiers joining Anduin Lothar's forces in Hillsbrad and the Hinterlands. Following the Horde's defeat, Turalian spearheaded Eastern Kingdom's reconstruction, uniting rulers to pool resources. However, Gilneas' alliance Euphoria waned. They advocated orc extermination instead of internment camps, creating friction. Disagreements over funding Nethergard keep construction deepened the divide, slowly pushing Gilneas away from the alliance of Lordaeron. The scars of war and conflicting ideals cast shadows over the once united front. Amidst the turmoil of Alterac betraying the Alliance and allowing the Orcus Horde to freely move through Aiden Perinold's kingdom, Isidin Perinold sought refuge in Gilneas, escaping the clutches of Alliance troops as they were occupying Alterac at the time. In a bold move during the Alterac Crisis, Greymane attempted to place Isidin on Alterac's throne, aiming to secure a direct stake in the kingdom's welfare and strategic advantages through its mountain passes. I'll talk a little more about this at the end of this section, because I was a bit confused about a couple things, but let's continue. King Greymane's motives didn't escape the watchful eyes of the Kirin Tor and King Tyrannus Menethil II. Greymane's ambitions hinted at expansion dreams, a foothold in Alterac would grant Gilneas access to untapped resources, offering a pretext to send mighty ships across the Great Sea. In the negotiations, Admiral Dalen Proudmore, fearing a threat to Kul'Tyrus' naval sovereignty, opposed Gilnean influence in the region. Despite the political maneuvering, Greymane's bid faltered, leaving him disheartened with the alliance of Lordaeron. The failed attempt cast shadows over the unity that once bound them, deepening the fractures within the alliance. In a candid conversation with Lord Vincent Godfrey, King Greymane expressed doubt about heeding the advice of Crowley and Godfrey regarding Gilneas' alliance with the alliance. He argued that this allegiance had only resulted in the loss of Gilnean lives. Greymane revealed his intention to withdraw from the alliance, sealing off Gilneas from the outside world. As he examined the map, the decision to construct a formidable wall as he examined the map, the decision to construct a formidable wall closing off borders would intersect with the lands of a respected nobleman, Lord Darius Crowley. The mountains on Crowley's lands provided a natural barrier for the wall's construction. The completion of this wall would effectively separate Pyrewood Village and Ambermill from the rest of Gilneas. Greymane was confident that Crowley, despite the impact on his lands, would comprehend the necessity of this decision. Given Gilneas' self-sufficiency and minimal dependency on the Alliance for resources, Greymane made it clear that aiding the other nations held little interest for him. The imminent changes signaled a shift towards Gilneas embracing isolation and self-reliance. So I wanted to talk about Isidin real quick, the whole Alterac deal. Originally what happened was that Perinold essentially betrayed the Alliance and let the orcs freely walk through Alterac in exchange to ensure that his people weren't harmed. So they didn't try and fight the Horde, they didn't do anything, they didn't signal the Alliance saying that the Horde is walking through. Now, Aiden Perinold was the king at the time, and he approved that, and he was the one who actually sent a letter to Doomhammer, who was war chief at the time, to organize that, and they, that's what happened. Now, later on, gets found out, and the Alliance isn't very happy. Surprising. It does mention that Gen supported Isidin to take control of Alterac, but King Tyrannus was wanting to give it to Lord Prestor, but those plans were later abandoned when Prestor quote-unquote disappeared. And since Prestor was Deathwing, really what happened was Deathwing was defeated in Grim Batal. But I couldn't find anything specifically talking about why Isidin was forced to leave under fear of the martial law, because I didn't see anything specifically saying that he was complacent in his uncle's treachery with helping the orcs. So I'm not sure if I just missed something, or what, but I just didn't see anything specifically saying that he actually helped his uncle with it 
it might have been because he was going to be the new royalty, but I'm not 100% sure. So, yeah, either way, that's what it says, so I went with it. And I did try and find it, but I just couldn't find anything specifically saying why he was running and why he had to hide inside Gilneas and take refuge there to avoid the martial law, since I didn't see anything specifically saying that he did anything knowingly wrong. Either way, let's go on to the next section. Years later, following the Second War, the Alliance of Lordaeron remained oblivious to the emergence of death cults within their borders. However, a series of events, including Quothloss's departure due to grievances over human leadership and Thrall liberating orcs from internment camps, promoted Gilneas to sever ties with the Alliance. King Greymane, seeking to shield his nation from what he perceived as other people's problems, initiated the construction of the Greymane Wall, completing it before the onset of the Third War. When the Scourge laid siege to Lordaeron, King Greymane sealed off the majority of Gilneas behind the wall, isolating the nation from the outside world. The natural berries of high cliffs and treacherous reefs fortified Gilneas both by land and sea. As the undead scourge wreaked havoc on neighboring lands, Gen Greyman, unmoved by pleas from even human refugees, adamantly refused to assist anyone on the outside of the wall. The fall of Lordaeron further solidified his belief that isolation was the right path for Gilneas. As planned, the wall separated the lands of Lord Darius Crowley, including Pyrewood Village and Ambermill. In an act of defiance, Lord Crowley dispatched the Gilneas Brigade to join Lady Jaina Proudmoore's human expedition in Kalimdor. Despite the internal conflict, the Gilneas Brigade gained renown for their valor in the face of the Burning Legion. As the Scourge swept through Silver Pine Forest, the folks of Pyrewood faced a closed Greymane Wall, shutting them off from refuge. Determined to survive, they embarked on the Sea Wolf, aiming for Stormwind City. However, a twist of fate sent their ship astray in a storm leaving them adrift in the vast Great Sea for weeks. Another tempest struck, leading to a shipwreck on the mysterious shores near Black Rook Hold's ancient fortress. With their vessel beyond repair and the land offering abundance, they seized the opportunity to establish a new home. Thus, the village of Bradensbrook rose on the shores of this mysterious island, a testament to resilience and adaptability in the face of unforeseen challenges. At the peak of their strength, the Scourge launched an unrelenting assault on the Greymain Wall, casting a dire shadow over all of Gilneas. Starting with a modest number, their ranks swelled over time, showing no signs of relenting. King Greymane's armies valiantly defended the wall for days against the overwhelming sea of undead hordes. However, the unyielding scourge replenished their forces relentlessly, creating a seemingly insurmountable challenge. Fearing an imminent breach, King Greymane made a difficult decision. The gates were flung open and Gilnean soldiers surged from Gilneas into Silver Pine Forest. In a tragic turn, the Scourge defeated these soldiers, dooming them into the fate of becoming that which they hated and feared so much. While the Greymane Wall initially held firm, the Gilnean military found itself unable to repel the Scourge solo. The looming threat of the undead completely overwhelming their forces hung heavily in the air, as the balance tipped precariously toward a chilling inevitability. In a desperate bid to repel the seemingly unstoppable Scourge, Greymane turned to his archmage Aragol for an answer. To Gen's relief, Arugal had an idea. He had heard of a mythical creature called the Worgen. It walked on two legs like human would, but was wolf-like in appearance. While he didn't know their full origin, he did know how to find them. He sensed them within the Emerald Dream. It would be a challenge to bring them to their aid. But the real question wasn't could he bring them to Gilneas? It was should he. Greyman was warned of the beast's unruly nature, but he saw no other option and they seemed like his only hope to fight the scourge that were pounding down his gate. As chaos ensued, the worgen extended their attacks to other humans in Silver Pine Forest. In response, King Greymane recalled his troops and permanently sealed the Greymane Wall's doors. Unfortunately, some retreating soldiers, now infected, secretly spread the worgen curse. Over the years, tales of strange attacks and mysterious disappearances multiplied. Fear gripped Gilneas as the curse, facilitated by the secretive wolf cult, insidiously eroded the kingdom's humanity. The wolf cult saw the curse as a gift. They called it the Purity. In an effort to save Gilneas, King Greymane traded one monstrous enemy for another. For an extended period, King Greymane enforced strict isolation, closing all ports and forbidding attempts to leave. This left sailors and people from other nations stranded within Gilneas, including the infamous brash tide crew of pirates. 
Occasionally, Gilnaeans locked out of their homeland surfaced in distant lands, like Baron Longshore, captain of the pirate ship Heedless in the Northern Barrens, or the notorious murderer Stalvin Mistmantle in Duskwood. The tale unfolds as a saga of isolation, unexpected consequences, and the haunting specter of a spreading curse. Gen Greymane and Lord Darius Crowley, who were once close friends, found themselves on opposing ends due to Greymane's unwavering isolationist stance. This ideological clash birthed a bitter feud between the factions known as Rebels and Royals. The Northgate Rebellion ignited the spark, with Crowley's rallying disgruntled Gilnaeans labeled as both terrorists and traitors by Loyalists. In a dramatic attempt to depose King Gen, Crowley's armed supporters stormed Gilnea city, triggering a brutal civil war that tore the nation apart. The critical point was when Crowley's forces, after setting the capital ablaze, faced fierce resistance from Greymane loyalists. Despite breaking through the city's defenses, the rebels couldn't overcome the determined opposition. The aftermath saw Crowley and other leaders imprisoned for high treason within Stoneward Prison. After the failed coup and Crowley's incarceration, remaining rebels slipped into hiding leaving weapon caches scattered and undiscovered throughout Gilneas. While Greymane reclaimed uncontested rule, the kingdom bore scars of the internal strife, weakened and vulnerable. In the shadows, the wolf cult led by Alpha Prime infiltrated Gilneas, terrorizing its forests. Keen to avoid panic post-Civil War, Greymane and nobles organized secret hunting parties during full moons in the Blackwald, targeting Pharaoh Worgen. Despite these efforts, the worgen persisted, haunting Gilneas for years and isolating Gilnean harbor towns from support from the rest of the kingdom. The legacy of the civil war and the lingering threat of the wolf cult cast a shadow over the once unified kingdom of Gilneas. Following the third war, refugees guided by Dalen Fordright sought sanctuary in the kingdom. However, their hopes were dashed by the impenetrable Greymane Wall, leaving them stranded. These survivors spared during the Scourge onslaught faced a grim fate at the hands of the Forsaken and the Worgen of Shadowfang Keep before Gilneas fell. Haunted by guilt over the Worgen's rampage, Aragal, driven to madness, embraced them as his own and withdrew to Shadowfang Keep. He actually referred to them as his children. There, he cast a curse upon Pyrewood Village's remaining residents, transforming them into Moon Rage Worgen every night, reverting to human form with the break of dawn. Efforts to rid Silver Pine Forest of Worgen led to the Forsaken eliminating Pyrewood Village, seeking aid from Horde Adventures to dismantle its ruling Council of Pyrewood. With the fall of the Council, the Forsaken was able to take control of the town. Now one character I want to talk about before we dive into Kata is Alpha Prime. He isn't in the game, but he is in the comics called Curse of the Worgen, and he is mentioned in lore for Gilneas, so I thought it was good to cover him. He doesn't have an extensive backstory, but I think it is important since he is known as the first Worgen. Now we start back in the War of the Seder. In the wake of the Great Sundering, Rolar found himself in the thick of the War of the Seder, standing shoulder to shoulder with his closest companion, Arvel, and the resilient Night Elves, including Belistra Starbreeze. Their battleground was a lush expanse of Ashenvale, where the shadows of Satyrs cast a looming threat. As the conflict unfolded and losses mounted, Rolar found himself at odds with Malfurion Stormrage. The source of contention was the deployment of the Pack Form, a power that Rolar believed could tip the scales and bring an end to the war. A heated debate ensued, driven by the desperate desire for strength in the face of adversity. The ties of disagreement turned into a tempest of hatred when tragedy struck. Arvel, bound by a promise to Malfurion to refrain from using the pack form after a loss of control, fell victim to satyr brutality. Unable to unleash the transformative power, Arvel became a defenseless target. The devastating loss of Arvel, beloved by Belisra, cast a heavy shadow over the once steadfast companionship leaving scars that ran deep. Now the pack form is another thing only mentioned in the comic and also in the Wolfheart book. That form is when the druid turns into a large wolf. It allows the druid the power and ferocity of the ancient wolf Goldrin. But there is a large side effect of this form. The fury that you feel and the power is too much to handle. Malfurion himself experimented with this form, but when he was consumed by its rage, he blindly attacked his mentor Cenarius. The only thing the demigod could do is put Malfurion to sleep, where he eventually regained his senses with the great tree, Darlner. But ever since that day, he forbid anyone to use that form due to the danger it posed. Now as surprising as this may sound, not everyone listened to Malfurion when he forbid the use of that form. The druids of the pack were the druids who did not listen. They initially sought to control the wolf form with the scythe of a loon, but due to the power that form has over the user, they lost themselves to the wolf form. 
However, Rilar stood as the lone druid who retained his sanity while embracing the formidable pack form. After besting the pack in combat, he extended an olive branch offering to guide them in preserving their sanity within the pack form. Thus, he ascended to the role of the druid's leader, donning the name Alpha Prime with pride. Teaming up with the embittered Belisra, the duo embarked on crafting the Scythe of Loon, envisioning a tool to harness the pack form's power. However, their aspirations took an unforeseen turn. Instead of mastering the form, the druids of the scythe found themselves metamorphosized into the mysterious worgen. These creatures, driven by madness, consider their transformation the epitome of nature's essence. In clashes with the satyrs, the worgen's unrestrained ferocity tore through allies and adversaries alike, spreading their curse to other night elves. Faced with the escalating worgen threat, Malfurion and Stormrage acknowledging the gravity of the situation wielded the scythe of a loon. In a decisive move, he banished the worgen to the tranquil embrace of the Emerald Dream, where they would rest for all eternity. The tale unfolded as nature's balance teetered on the edge of chaos. But as we know, the worgen didn't stay in the Emerald Dream. When Gilneas was affected with the curse, Halford Ramsey, who was a private investigator looking into the murders in the city, was turned into a worgen by Alpha Prime. His plan was to make sure that Halford didn't discover about the Starlight Slasher murders and the planned worgen attack on Gilneas City, along with his true intentions. But Halford joined the other worgens and went through the ritual to make sure his human and wolf aspects could live harmoniously with each other. Alpha Prime orchestrated an infiltration of Gilneas, navigating hidden tunnels beneath the imposing Grey Main Wall. He planned to secure the Scythe of Loon, a key to liberating his fellow worgen banished to the Emerald Dream. Armed with his mystical artifact, he harbored ambitions of revenge against Malfurion and a future assault on Darnassus. For his plans, Alpha Prime forged an alliance with the Forsaken, leveraging the Worgen assault on Gilnea City to pave the way for the impending Forsaken invasion. Amidst the chaos of the Wolf Cult's attack on the city, Alpha Prime found himself confronted by Belisra, one of the architects of the Scythe of Loon. In the heart of the turmoil between the fall of Greymane Court and the impending chaos in Merchant Square, Alpha Prime laid bare his desire for revenge against Malfurion. He accused the revered druid of conveniently forsaking ethics and denounced the duplicity inherent in the storm-raged bloodline. Belisra, however, countered with revelation of Malfurion's internal struggles and guilt over Arvel's demise, unveiling a pivotal truth. She disclosed Malfurion's own encounter with the pack form Frenzy. This revelation struck a chord with Alpha Prime, branding Malfurion as not only a fool but the ultimate hypocrite. The battle between the two unfolded amidst the chaos reaching its climax around the time of Darius Crowley's heroic last stand in the Cathedral Quarter. Salvation came when Halford intervened, attacking Alpha Prime and providing Belisra the opportunity to employ the Light of Loon. With a strategic maneuver, she sent Alpha Prime plunging into one of the city's canals, affording them a fleeting escape from the battleground. The Forsaken also sought the elusive Scythe of Loon, yet their clandestine efforts were thwarted by an unexpected hero, the Worgen player. With strategic prowess, the scythe was reclaimed and restored to the grasp of Priestess Belisra, who had been its guardian. Under the false assumption that the Gilneans and Belisra's night elves were stripped of the scythe's power, Alpha Prime, undeterred, orchestrated a wolf cold assault on Belisra's forces at Teldoran. To his astonishment, she defied expectations, revealing the scythe of Alun's might in a bid to banish Alpha Prime's worgens to the Emerald Dream. As she began the spell, a disruptive arrow from a forsaken Dark Ranger struck her arm, causing her to drop the scythe. Seizing the opportunity, Alpha Prime's forsaken allies closed in on Belisra and her Gilnean comrades. Alpha Prime, seizing the scythe of a loon, poised to strike down Belisra, found his plans unraveling in a surprise turn. In a spectral spectacle, the ghost of Arvel manifested as a spirit wolf, tearing Alpha Prime apart before he could deliver the fatal blow. Unseen by many within the kingdom, a clandestine war unfolded among the worgen themselves, a hidden strife between beast and man. Meanwhile, an impending worgen threat loomed larger as the Forsaken relentlessly pounded at Gilneas' gates, driven by Garrosh Hellscream's directive to conquer the land for hoard resources and secure ports. Sylvanas Windrunner, under War Chief Hellscream's orders, secretly orchestrated her own plan. Beyond the conquest, she sought the elusive Scythe of Loon an artifact capable of summoning docile worgen that could potentially spread their curse to humanity at large. Days preceding the wolf cult's assault, King Gen Greymane took action. Concerned about escalating attacks, including the mysterious Starlight Slasher murders, he directed his son, Prince Liam Greymane, 
to bolster the military presence across Gilneas. When questioned about potentially reallocating troops, Gen adamantly refused, fearing forsaken exploitation of any perceived weakness in the wall's defenses. To avoid causing panic among civilians, Liam was tasked with attributing the increased military activity to Northgate rebels stirring trouble once again. As the Worgen launched their fateful attack, the capital descended into chaos, locked down in a desperate bid for survival. The Grey Main Court, the first bastion, succumbed to the cunning leadership of Alpha Prime, orchestrating the relentless assaults across the city. Notably, the Bloodfang Pack, nursing deep resentment for Gilneas, joined the ranks. Ivar Bloodfang's statements revealed a lingering bitterness over Gilneas abandoning and leaving them to perish beyond the Grey Main Wall. After the fall of Merchant Square, King Gen took a decisive step. He ordered the release of Lord Darius Crowley and the Northgate rebels from Stoneward Prison. These former adversaries, shedding the baggage of Civil War grudges, agreed to collaborate. Crowley's forces, armed with hidden artillery stashes, joined Greymane's efforts. As the survivors regrouped at the Greymane court, Crowley and his men bravely accepted a daunting mission, drawing as many worgen as possible to the Cathedral Quarter, providing a distraction for the evacuation to Duskhaven. While civilians quietly left the capital, rebels valiantly fought until overwhelmed, succumbing to the worgen curse in Light Dawn's chapel. In Duskhaven, royal chemist Krenin Aranus exhibited a remarkable skill, temporarily restoring sanity to captured feral worgen with his potions. Simultaneously, guided by the night elf Belisra Starbreeze, a secret counselor to Greymane, many worgen sought refuge in Taldoren within the Blackwald. There, they engaged in the ritual of balance, striving to master their curse and achieve harmony between their human and wolf aspects. The Genlian's respite didn't last long thanks to the sudden arrival of the Cataclysm, which wrecked havoc on the protective reeves shielding Gilneas from the sea. The once impregnable Grey Main Wall crumbled under the cataclysmic forces, opening the gates for the Forsaken to infiltrate Gilneas from both Silverpine and Duskmist shore. As the Forsaken onslaught unfolded, the southwestern expanse of Gilneas succumbed to the relentless sea, engulfing Duskhaven in its destructive embrace. In the face of the initial breach, the resilient military held their ground at the Grey Main Wall, armed with muskets, burning oil, flaming arrows, and aided by recently cured worgen on the walls. They valiantly resisted the Forsaken's advance. They evacuated to Grey Main Manor during the seismic turmoil. Gunland survivors sought refuge in Stormglen Village. Meanwhile, King Gen Grey Main and Lord Vincent Godfrey embarked on a crucial journey to Taldoren. Their mission: to implore Darius Crowley and other worgen healed by night elves to join forces against the Forsaken. Despite Lord Godfrey's authoritarian stance, Crowley hesitated until Greymane, revealing his own succumbing to the Worgen curse, appealed as a friend rather than a king. United by a cause transcending Gilnean law, they forged an alliance against the Forsaken, setting the stage for a collective struggle that surpassed political divides. In the fierce battle for Gilnea city, Prince Liam led the Gilean forces, carving through the capital to dismantle the Forsaken stronghold, 
converging with Lord Crowley's Worgen forces around Stoneward Prison, they confronted and defeated the menacing flesh beast Gorot. The tide began to turn against Sylvanas, prompting a desperate move. She aimed a poisoned arrow at King Gen. In a selfless act, Liam leaped in front of the bowshot, sacrificing himself to save his father and liberate the city from forsaken control. Liam, no! As the dust settled, revelations unfolded, learning of the Forsaken's intent to unleash the new plague on the capital. Gen faced a challenging decision. Respecting his son's wish to prioritize the safety of their people, he chose not to pursue Sylvanas. The evacuation plan took shape, guiding everyone to safety through the hidden Undertaker's Pass, leading to Aldrich's repose. The aftermath echoed with sacrifice, unity, and the resilience of a people determined to secure their future. May the light bless the spirits of our ancestors, for they've chosen to allow my son to rest upon this holy ground. It is here, surrounded by the heroes and patriots of Gilneus, where he belongs. You were a true man of the people, Liam. Unlike any royal I've ever met, will make them pay for this. Gilneus will remember your courage forever, Liam. We'll return, Liam. I swear this to you. Upon reaching Keel Harbor, a glimmer of hope emerged on the horizon. A fleet of night elven ships gracefully approached the coast. Once again, the mysterious allies from across the sea had arrived to extend a helping hand to Gen Greymane and his overwhelmed people. True to Ballistra's promise, the Night Elves not only brought ships, but also presented an offer of sanctuary in their lands. Despite facing relentless assaults from the Forsaken and their Horde allies, the determined survivors secured the port. Every Gilnean who weathered the storm of adversity boarded the transport ships, while a resilient contingent led by Darius Crowley stayed behind to form the Gilnaeus Liberation Front. Admiral Nightwind steered the remaining survivors to safety at Rut Theron Village in Darnassus. Fueled by the relentless curse and looming forsaken threat, Gilneas found itself embraced by the Alliance once again. A profound debt of gratitude was owed to the Night Elves, whose intervention played a pivotal role in healing the minds of those ensnared by the Worgen curse. As the civilian populace sought refuge in Teldrassil, the Calderai generously granted asylum within the Howling Oak, a symbol grown by Night Elven druids from a seed originating in Gilneas. This oak stood not just as a testament to the hardships endured by the Gilneans since the kingdom's ruin, but also celebrated the remarkable resilience and accomplishments of their people in the face of adversity. After finding refuge in the embrace of Teldrassil's woods, the Gilneans settled into a rustic existence while a secluded clearing awaited those seeking the ritual of balance. The official embrace of Gilneas into the alliance hung in the balance, contingent on the approval of other alliance representatives. King Greymane stepped into the limelight during the welcoming banquet in Darnassus, acknowledging the grave error of isolating his kingdom behind walls. A costly mistake. Grateful for the Alliance's second chance, he expressed his heartfelt thanks. While the Alliance dignitaries appeared receptive to Greymane's apology, tensions escalated with the arrival of King Varian Wrynn, whose words hinted at Gilneas being seen as cowardly and weak. Despite the insults hurled at him and his people, King Greymane maintained his composure attempting to convince the Stormwind King that Gilneas had undergone a transformation and was now poised to be a steadfast supporter of the Alliance. However, Varian distanced himself, nursing the bitterness stemming from Gilneas' perceived betrayal during the Third War's darkest hours. In the grand meeting between Gen Greymane and Gilneas' envoys and the Alliance delegates, a strategic decision was made to showcase Gilneas as a potent ally rather than a burden on the faction. The Gilnean military standing tall with their king paraded in synchronized formation, proudly brandishing the banner of Gilneas and playing their anthem. Despite Gilneas facing adversity, they deliberately matched the forces sent by the Stormwind army, capping off their display by orchestrating a transformation into formidable Worgen warriors. While the Alliance acknowledged the strengths and advantages brought by Gilneas, the King of Stormwind remained unyielding. He pointedly expressed his inability to trust or forgive Gilneas dismissing them as fair-weather friends. This stark stance, despite the recognized benefits, sparked uproar at the summit and ultimately shattered any hope Gilneas harbored of rejoining the Alliance. During this time, and before the final battle in Ashenvale, Varian went through the ritual of balance as well to control his rage. Through those trials, Varian learned that he was Goldrin's champion, and finally got control of his rage to where he would work with Gen and the Gilneans. 
There is more to it, but I'll cover Varian in his own video in the future, but that's the very short version of it. During the conflict in Ashen Vale, as the Horde, led by Garrosh Hellscream and accompanied by formidable Magnetar, advanced into the region, the Gilan forces rallied to the aid of King Ren. Together, bolstered by Worgen reinforcements and guided by Varian's leadership, they staged a decisive counterattack that shifted the tide of battle. Under Varian's command, the Alliance successfully repelled the invading army. In the aftermath, recognizing the valuable contribution of the Worgen, Varian advocated for a second Alliance summit. The proposal for the Worgen's induction into the Alliance was put to a vote and officially approved. Addressing the gathered leaders, King Varian acknowledged the rising threats challenging their hard-won peace. With the Worgen standing united with the Alliance, Varian expressed confidence that they would prevail honorably against any challenges that lay ahead. Now aligned with the Alliance, Lord Crowley and his steadfast Worgen warriors of the Gilneas Liberation Front reignited their conflict against the Forsaken, pushing deep into the northern reaches of Silver Pine Forest. Their successful seizure of Pyrewood Village served as a strategic foothold, even though Sylvanas' forces later reclaimed it amidst tenacious resistance. Utilizing a gnomish submarine to break the Horde's blockade, the elite 7th Legion spearheaded a sweeping alliance offensive aimed at retaking all of Lordaeron from the Forsaken, commencing with the liberation of Gilneas. The unified strength of the alliance, bolstered by Gilnean and newfound Bloodfang Worgen allies, swiftly forced the Forsaken beyond the Grey Main Wall. Despite initial success, the Horde regrouped in Silverpine, leading to Lord Crowley's surrender to Sylvanas when she held his daughter hostage, threatening her with a grim fate of undeath. This marked the termination of the Alliance offensive in Silverpine, while the Bloodfang Pack extended their influence into the Hillsbrad foothills. Amidst the mass exodus, numerous Gilnean refugees sought refuge in the Blasted Lands, inspired by the dream of an idealistic druid named Marl Wormthorn. Upon their arrival, Wormthorn envisioned the healing of the Tainted Scar, attempting to restore it by birthing the great tree Maldraz through his druidic powers. Initially successful, the rejuvenated forest allowed the refugees to establish Serwick. However, this act also attracted the attention of lingering demons within the Scar, seizing the opportunity to corrupt both the great tree and the Gilnean druid. The result was the birth of the malevolent Tainted Tree. At some point, a sizable fleet of Gilnean ships set sail for Serwick, carrying only civilians. Unfortunately, after a few days, a mysterious storm caused some ships to return to the shattered shore, revealing their unknown demise and the haunting presence of their drowned occupants along the coast. Now we move over to Kalimdor, where the Talon Branch Pack found solace in Fellwood, where they embarked on a journey to comprehend the intricacies of nature and maintain its delicate equilibrium. Their purpose extended beyond mere survival. They sought a new existence in this accursed land. Led by Denmother Ulrika, the pack comprised Worgen with a lineage dating back to Valinda Starsong's initial summoning of the Worgen through the Scythe of Loon, making them Night Elven Worgen. Alongside them were Gilneans who endured the collapse of their kingdom. Together, they established Talon Branch Glade as their operational hub, with a dual mission to mend the corrupted forest and confront the demonic forces of the Burning Legion, all while thwarting the goblin lumber operations orchestrated by the Bilgewater Cartel in the region. Simultaneously, a contingent of Gilneans under the leadership of Oliver Harris embarked on a journey to Raven Hill in Duskwood. Setting up camp, their focus shifted to devising a cure to aid the countless mindless worgen wrecking havoc in the area. Atop Mount Hygel, certain Gilnean worgen fell victim to the corrupting clutches of the Twilight's Hammer, becoming enslaved as mindless beasts under their influence. While others aligned themselves with the noble cause of the Cenarian Circle, they embraced their role as guardians, taking on the responsibility of safeguarding Goldrin's sacred shrine. At some point, a black draconoid disguised as Lord Hiram Creed cunningly manipulated a group of Gilnean humans and worgen known as the Black Howl. Acting in secrecy, Creed infused them with his draconic blood, enhancing their strength while unknowingly subjugating them to a gradual transformation into his unwilling minions. Rathian, on a mission to eradicate corrupted black dragons across Azeroth, dispatched a rogue champion to eliminate Creed. The demise of Creed marked a turning point, prompting both the Horde and Elias to withdraw from Gilneas' mainland for reasons shrouded in mystery. Consequently, the epicenter of activity shifted the coastal regions, where the battle for Gilneas unfolded in relentless clashes between the Alliance and Horde forces. After toppling Garrosh Hellscream in the Siege of Orgrimmar, High King Varian Ren declared that the Alliance's next mission was to cleanse Gilneas and keep Sylvanas Windrunner in check. 
Now, during the trial of Garrosh Hellscream, King Greymane took a bold stand, vetoing the entire proceeding. He accused the Horde leaders of complicity in their war chief's crime, highlighting the brutal actions against the people of Gilneas. Greymane insisted that all of them should face trial, pointing out that even figures like Sylvanas had initiated their own attacks. However, Terran Zhu calmly rejected the proposal, citing the impracticality of such a lengthy process, especially considering the varying lifespans of those involved. During the Third Burning Legion invasion, the Valiant Gilneas military took a stand in the epic battle for Broken Shore. Guided by King Greymane, the indomitable Gilneas Brigade set up their main bastion, Greywatch, nestled in Stormheim. Their mission was to unearth the legendary Aegis of Agrimar scattered across the Broken Isles. As the Brigade delved into their quest, a sinister revelation surfaced. The Forsaken harbored nefarious plans to unleash a plague upon Greywatch, reminiscent to the tragic fate that befell Gilneas. King Greymane rallied his forces to obliterate the plague caches and thwart the invasive legions under the cunning Sylvanas Windrunner. Following the battle, the Gilneas Brigade fanned out across the Broken Isles, engaging in a fierce struggle for control of the Warden Towers against the formidable Queensguard. A relentless dance of power ensued as both factions vied for dominance. With the relocation of Dalaran to the Broken Isles, the once gleaming Silver Enclave underwent a transformation, emerging as the Greyfang Enclave. This newfound enclave, now a bastion for the Alliance within the floating city, stood under the watchful guardianship of Gilnean Sentinels. As the curtains fell on the Argus campaign, a somber narrative unfolded for the kingdom, its identity now reduced to a sorrowful echo of wind, sorrow, and ruin. Gen Greymane, bearing witness to the aftermath, shared with Anduin the tragic tales of Gilneas and Strongguard succumbing to the relentless grip of decay. Gilneas, once vibrant, now housed the Forsaken, while Strongguard found itself besieged by a motley alliance of criminals, ogres, and trolls. The once proud realms now stood as haunting echoes of their former glory. In the throes of the War of the Thorns, that's the name of the war with Sylvanas burning down Teldrassil, Sylvanas sought to exploit the desolation of Gilneas as a catalyst within the Alliance after the fall of Teldrassil. Misjudging Gen's desire to reclaim his kingdom, a divide emerged between those advocating for the recovery of Teldrassil and those prioritizing the reclamation of Gilneas. Unbeknownst to Sylvanas, Gen, acknowledging a debt owed to the Night Elves, emphasized that Teldrassil must be reclaimed first, with Gilneas following suit. In response, King Anduin ordered constant portals from Darnassus to remain open in Stormwind City, welcoming an influx of Night Elven and Gilnean refugees. Queen Mia Greymane, a respected figure, played a crucial role in organizing the Gilnean evacuation from the Howling Oak to Stormwind City. All Gilnean refugees were safely relocated before the onset of the fire, settling around Olivia's pond. As the Fourth War commenced, Gilneas actively participated in the battle for Lordaeron. The Bloodfang Pact securing Fenris Isle forced the Forsaken to reallocate their forces for evacuation across the lake after defeating Deathstalker Hayward. Simultaneously, Darius Crowley led an offensive into Hillsbrad Foothills, preparing an army to counter an eminent Forsaken attack on Gilneas. The Seventh Legion, under Captain Tobias Zarin, besieged Shadowfang Keep, aiming to thwart Forsaken Apothecary's plans of unleashing a bioweapon upon Gilneas. The Horde, eyeing Strongguard as a strategic launching point, maneuvered towards the Arathi Highlands, seeking control of Strongguard to impede full alliance dominance over the Eastern Kingdoms. Now, in the aftermath of Stormwind's refusal to aid Darkshore, Gilneas chose to support the Kaldari instead. King Greymane dispatched a formidable force, led by Lorna Crowley and Princess Tess Greymane, as part of the Army of the Black Moon. This gesture aimed not only to stand by their Night Elf allies, but also to repay them for their unwavering support to Gilneas. During the Battle of Dazar Alor, King Greymane led his Gilnean soldiers against Orc Grunts and Zandalari allies at the port of Zandalar. Gan, alongside Master Matthias Shaw, spearheaded the strike team against King Rastakhan. Subsequently, during the Battle at the Gates of Orgrimmar, High King Anduin Wren entrusted Gan and his troops with the mission to flank the Orcish city, leading to the successful capture of the Western Gate. In another development, the Night Elves of the Temple of Elune in Val Shirah forged active trade connections with the neighboring Gilnean village of Bradensbrook. This exchange facilitated the shipment of supplies between the two communities via ships. In the aftermath of the Forsaken reclaiming the ruins of Lordaeron, Kalia Menethil, a member of the Desolate Council, assured Alliance heroes that her foremost proposal to the Council would involve the withdrawal of their forces from Gilneas. King Greymane returned to Stormwind City proclaiming the moment had arrived to reclaim Gilneas. However, during their absence, the Scarlet Crusaders, under the leadership of Inquisitor Fairbell, took control of the capital. 
transforming it into their stronghold after a defeat in Silverpine Forest against the Forsaken. Princess Tess Greymane, entrusted with command from Keel Harbor, orchestrated the efforts of Gilnean troops and their allies from the 7th Legion, despite resistance from the King. Tess sought support from unconventional sources such as Lillian Voss and Callia Menethil from the Desolate Council. They are here to help us retake Gilnea's father. They are the reason we were driven out! Have you forgotten? Again, it's Kalia. Kalia Menethil, not some mindless scourge. Let her speak. The Forsaken know the Scarlet Crusade better than anyone, King Greymane. You have little reason to trust us, but I give you my word. As a Menethil, we only wish to return what rightfully belongs to you. Tess, every time I look at them, I see your brother's face. I can't. I'm sorry, but perhaps you can show me the way. Similar to the undead, the Scarlet Crusade branded the worgen as cursed monsters and heretics to be purged from Azeroth. They received orders to exterminate all worgen on sight, even resorting to exhuming bodies in Aldrich's repose to incinerate their bones and cleanse them in the light. This horrific act had to be stopped by any means necessary. The Scarlet Crusade wasn't going to get away with defiling the sacrifice of Gilneans made in their homeland. They had to be left to rest. While the Forsaken created a diversion, the Allied forces utilized Undertaker's past to infiltrate the capital. After eliminating the most experienced Crusade forces, Tess swung open the gates of Greymane Court. Battles erupted across the capital, with the most intense clashes occurring in the Cathedral Quarter, where Gilneas confronted formidable zealots and their leader. The pivotal moment came with the defeat of Inquisitor Farabell in Light's Dawn Cathedral. Gilneas was reclaimed by its people, and true to their word, the Forsaken withdrew. In the aftermath, King Gen engaged in a profound conversation with Princess Tess. You're thinking of Liam again, aren't you? <laughs> you always could see right through me. You never really healed after you lost him. After you lost Gilneas. <sighs> Tess... I... I see you, father. Always hiding from your pain. It's why you built that wall in the first place. And why you took Anduin under your wing. But I have always been here. For you. Even if you've never noticed. I know. And... I'm sorry. The world is changing, Tess. And as much as I try, I find it hard to change with it. But you have proven yourself a thousand times over, my girl. And this kingdom now belongs to you. Father, I... I... You have always been what makes Gilneas truly special to me. And I should have told you that every day. I wish I could take your pain away. Only time will do that, my dear. But we have time now. Thanks to you. After talking with Tess, Gen makes his way to Liam's grave, where he talks about his decision. Stag I don't know if you would recognize me, Liam. All these years, the lessons I've learned. The Alliance has always offered an outstretched hand. And there are days it feels right, and days I wonder what if I had not built that wall? 
Would Lordaeron still stand? Would you still be? Ah, but listen to me. The ruminations of an old man. You did not live long enough to regret, as I do. Your sister will lead the kingdom now. No one could be more proud of her than your mother and I. Except, perhaps, you. Rest well, my son. Gilneas is in the best of hands. Now, I figured I'd talk about the Worgens, and there might be a couple places where I repeat myself a little bit from before, but I tried to make sure it wasn't much. In the ancient days within the fierce conflict between Night Elves and Demonic Satyrs in Kalimdor, a group of druids delved into a formidable, albeit challenging, shape that epitomized the ferocity of the wolf ancient Goldrin. Guided by Ralar Fangfire, these druids of the pack aspired to reign in the untamed fury embedded in their chosen form. In pursuit of control, they willingly subjected themselves to the arcane energies of the Scythe of Loon, a mystical relic forged from Goldrin's Fang and the Staff of Loon. However, instead of quelling the druid's fury, the weapon wrought a profound transformation upon Ralar and his followers morphing them into worgen, savage humanoids ensnared by their own primal instincts. Engulfed in an uncontrollable rage, Rilar's druids, now worgen, recklessly wreaked havoc on both ally and adversary in their clash with the satyrs. Night elves wounded by these unruly creatures fell prey to a relentless curse, compelling them to transform into worgen themselves. Striving to halt the rampant spread of the affliction, archdruid Malfurion Stormrage sorrowfully banished the worgen into the Emerald Dream where they would slumber peacefully for all eternity. Throughout the passing years, the Scythe of Elune found refuge in Ashenvale, fading into obscurity along with the Druids of the Scythe, the original Worgen. Their existence became a mere whisper in the books of history, with Fandral Staghelm's journal serving as the lone remnant of their forgotten tale. Before the resurgence, the Wolfmen lingered in human folklore as Worgen, existing only in hushed tales and fanciful stories of old. Farmers would regale their children with myths of these beastly wolfmen prowling the fields and marshes beyond the village confines. In his scholarly pursuits, the mage Yor glimpsed the worgen in a realm he described as a nightmarish abyss. Despite his desire to validate the reality, he cautioned against summoning these mysterious beings. While many remained dormant, certain Calderai worgen awakened and traversed the dream realm after their banishment while others delved into the shadows in the period preceding their resurgence. As discussed before, Eregal brought the worgen to Azeroth to help Gilneas fight the Scourge. But after the worgen were done with the Scourge, they turned their sights on the Gilnean soldiers. Following the Scourge's retreat, Archmage Eregal committed an act of betrayal against his nation, pledging allegiance to Alpha Prime and developing a fervent loyalty to the worgen. Gilnean soldiers bitten by the worgen found themselves taken within the protective walls, Whereupon succumbing to the curse, they were relentlessly hunted and killed, yet eradication proved elusive. Alpha Prime, the mastermind behind the worgen in Silverpine Forest, held the once mighty Arugal under his spell, his mind consumed by madness. Under the leadership of Alpha Prime and the assistance of the bewitched Archmage Aragal, the worgen in Silverpine launched a relentless siege on Baron Silverline's keep. Perched above the quaint Pyrewood village, the keep succumbed to darkness, evolving into the notorious Shadowfang Keep. It was here that Alpha Prime and Aragal established the Wolf Cult, embarking on a quest to locate the elusive Scythe of Loon. The Wolf Cult actively recruited humans eager to embrace the Worgen transformation, and the curse swiftly spread to the human populace. Ordinary men and women found themselves transformed into voracious, feral beings impervious to the grip of undeath. Aragal, with his arcane prowess, cursed the villagers of Pyrewood, compelling them to morph into Worgen as night fell. Those aligned with Alpha Prime formed the Bloodfang Pack. Aragal's followers became the Shadowfang Pack, and those bound to the nightly Worgen appearance became the Moon Rage Pack. And that's gonna do it for this one. Hopefully you did enjoy. This one, honestly, I got a little overwhelmed with everything, and so anxiety kind of kicked in, and I was overthinking a lot, but glad it's done. There is more to the Worgen's side their history but well honestly i just wanted to get this video out but i figured those points were good to talk about in the future i'll probably do a specific video on worgen or creatures like the worgen so 
I'll dive into more of that in the future, but I will say I've learned quite a bit while doing this video in a better, more efficient way, I think, to do it to where I don't get overwhelmed to where my brain just kind of shuts off. Either way, hope you'd enjoy, and I'm sure I mispronounced a couple things, like the mage your, I think it's er, maybe? Just you are, so I'm not totally sure, I'm just gonna go with er. I've had to fix uh, Aragal eight times, yeah, eight times, because I kept saying Arugal. Hopefully I didn't miss any. Hopefully this made sense. I tried to confirm a bunch of different things and make sure it was all legit. There's a bunch of quest lines. There's a bunch of stuff from different books that I didn't have, so I couldn't really confirm or go into more detail about that. And I didn't have the time to do all of the quest lines because some of them are buried at the very end of a quest line and some of those quest lines can take a couple hours, if not more, to do. If I did miss anything, let me know in the comments. If you did enjoy, possibly consider liking and subscribing. It's much appreciated. I don't really ask for those very much. And if you made it this far, I hope you, uh, I hope you already are. <laughs> Alrighty. I will see you in the next one. Do take care of yourself. And thanks for watching.